Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, Professor of Physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of What to Look For in the Night Sky. Uh, we're talking about the week of March 3rd this time around. And so the moon's going to get a little bit intrusive by the end of the week, but let's start there. And let's look at the evening of March 5th into the morning of March 6th. The moon will be sitting about six and a half degrees. Remember, your fist held out at arm's length. Those of you who watch these all the time are tired of me saying this, right? Uh, but your fist held out at arm's length is about 10 degrees. So about two-thirds of a fist width at arm's length, the moon will be sitting above Jupiter. And Jupiter sits right below Tau, Tari, in, in the constellation Taurus. And so these are... Um, these are things we've been looking at before. So you see the moon is about six and a half degrees, about 50% full. So you have a half full moon on the evening of March 5th. Uh, is, is sitting here uh, about six and a half degrees above the big bright Jupiter. And Jupiter, the V of stars that is the Hyades. So Jupiter sits above, Jupiter sits above Aldebaran, uh, the bright orange star here, and the V of Hyades that angles back out this direction. And so the Hyades, let's talk about this for just a second. The Hyades is actually an open star cluster. So we talk about asterisms being the pattern of stars we see on the sky, a grouping of stars, but they aren't all necessarily at the same distance from us. And so they're not a cluster, they're not grouped in space. A star cluster has to be stars that are gravitationally held together. They're what you know, at least temporarily, at least at the moment, are, 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 are there uh, in one single tight group in space. So they're, they're associated with, with one another. And typically an open star cluster that we talk about, uh, or globular, but an open star cluster, uh, these stars were all formed out of the same cloud of gas at the same time. So we like these open star clusters. The Hyades is one of the examples of the closest of these star clusters we have in the sky. So this is actually not just an asterism, this V that we see right here, uh, and there's other stars in that cluster. Uh, it's an actual open star cluster, stars that were formed together and are the same distance from us. And out over here, I didn't draw it, but I should have, out over here, you might be familiar with the Pleiades, is another example of a very close, nice, beautiful open star cluster that we see. Now out this direction of away from Jupiter. So you start with Jupiter here and go about four and two-thirds degrees. So about half a fist width out on from Jupiter out this direction. And you get a group of three NGC, uh, NGC objects, NGC 1746, NGC 1750, and NGC 1758. Now, once upon a time, these were all three classed as open star clusters. Uh, we think we've figured out that NGC 1746 is just an asteroid, and those stars aren't actually associated with one another in space. But go out and see if you can find this region. One low-power eyepiece field of view in your small telescope will show all three of them together. NGC 1750 is brighter and sparser. Brighter stars spread more, more widely apart, and NGC 1758 is fainter and denser. So a denser packing of stars, but they're fainter stars. But in 1746, looks a lot like 1750. It's just not an actual cluster. But what all this means is it's really hard to tell what you're looking at in there because you're looking at the disk of the galaxy, the disk of the Milky Way galaxy, where all these stars live, and it's fairly densely packed. It's just a very dense star region that you're looking at, and it's hard to identify what's a cluster, what's not a cluster, which of these objects you're, fi you're finding. But see what you can do with it. Use your small telescope to move about half a fist width from Jupiter out this direction and scan around and see what you find that looks like uh, a star cluster. Go on and see if you can see pictures of these objects and find out if they, they look like the patterns that you're seeing in there or not. So that's an interesting task, an interesting thing to do. Star cluster, star cluster, star cluster, star cluster, asterism. So we got these open star clusters. They live, open star clusters, recall, live in the disk of our galaxy and they are uh, so, so we see them associated with these bright starry backgrounds like in Taurus here. Uh, so this is a great place to see these. Now, three nights later, the evening of March 9th, 8th into the morning of March 9th, the moon will have filled out to three quarters full and will be moved over and will pass one and a half degrees above Mars. And Mars sits just below Iota uh, Geminorium. I, the Iota star in Gemini, a 3.8 magnitude star, is right there in the region too. And so Mars is here. Mars is back in prograde motion and is moving off this direction. And so um, uh, we'll, we'll track that 
in the coming weeks. So the moon's filled out to about three quarters. Well, this gives us a sense. We've talked about this before. Not all the objects of the solar system are orbiting in a flat disk plane. It's not, it's not a flat and perfect plane. They have some angles that they're tilted relative, their orbits are tilted relative to the sun, uh, relative to the Earth's orbit around the sun as we look through there. So the fact that the moon passes within one and a half degrees of Mars, and it was six and a half degrees of Jupiter, gives us a sense of, of some of that range, right? So you can think about... Uh, those angles as you look at this. Now, as we keep thinking about the planets, uh, Venus is in retrograde motion. So Venus has started moving west against the background stars. We said last week, Venus is going to disappear rapidly in the evening sky and, and pop out in the morning sky. And this is what helps it do it. It, it has started its retrograde motion. So it's moving to the west toward the evening, uh, the sun in the evening sky. And so this is, a, this is a catch it while you can moment. Get out and enjoy Venus as a bright object in the evening sky as it starts this retrograde motion. Uh, it always was, even if it didn't have retrograde motion, uh, the sun was always going to catch it. And it, it, this was always going to happen, that it was going to disappear in the glow of the sun. We're going to lose it and it's going to become a morning object. But it's going to happen very, very rapidly because of this retrograde motion of Venus. It's, you know, this retrograde happens as we catch up and pass objects. And, and we see Venus now moving the opposite direction there. Uh, let's look at one more thing, okay? That's all we got for you this week is one more thing, but this is a great thing. As we head to the spring sky, the spring is the time for us to really go out and look for external galaxies. There's lots of them in the Virgo-Leo region, and we'll look at those next week. Uh, not next week, there's going to be too much moon, but two weeks from now, uh, we'll think about galaxies in the Virgo-Leo region, and we'll just pick a few out. Uh, we've done this in years past as we go through spring. We'll just pick a few out, uh, one a week or two a week, and, and think about galaxies here. But for now, in the evening sky, as it gets dark, you look north, there's the Big Dipper. For those of us uh, who live beautifully north like I do, uh, I didn't draw that very well, did I? Um, you see the, the, the Big Dipper has this, this handle. I did okay, but it has this handle that arcs down this direction. And so that's the handle of the Big Dipper. And the last star in the handle of the Big Dipper, uh, the sitting right above it here, is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And it's about three and a half degrees up from that last star. Now, if you want to see it in the evening sky just after sunset like this, do it early. Do it March 3rd, okay? Go out and see it before the moon fills out and starts to wash it out. This is not a trivial object to see. It's a beautiful galaxy. It's one of the galaxies you see pictures of around more frequently than others. It's a, a face-on spiral, so, so that you're, you're looking through the flat part of the spiral, which means it's big, so you, it looks like this, not like this to your line of sight. And so it's, it's big, but it's faint because the integrated starlight through the disk like this uh, you're looking through a lot of stars, a lot of stars. You add up a lot of starlight as you're, as you're looking through there, and it gets bright, edge on. But face on like this, you don't have as many stars to add up, so it's relatively faint. Uh, we say it's, it's, you know, it's, it's brightness density, it's, it's, it's surface brightness is low relative to the background. It can merge into the background pretty easily if you don't have good dark skies. But it's big, so it's relatively easy to, to, to find as you sweep across it. So these two things are working against each other as you try to find it. But it's this beautiful space, face on spiral galaxy that has a companion galaxy that it's interacting with, a small little knot. So you see this picture out there a fair amount where it's got this other galaxy out here like this. See if you can find this object. So either go early in the week in the, in the evening like this, or later in the week if you get to March 5th, the, the moon is going to be setting at around 1 in the morning or something like that. Around midnight or 1 in the morning, the moon's going to be setting. And so if you want to wait until closer to dawn, an, an early morning, then the Big Dipper will have rotated around the pool. Boy, I just did a terrible job drawing this Dipper, didn't I? Uh, the Big Dipper will have rotated around the pole like this, and it'll be higher up in the sky, easier to see higher up in the sky, and the moon will have set. So that's probably your better bet, is wait for a few hours anyway. Let the dipper get high in the sky. But the dipper climbing straight up into the northern sky is an indicator of spring to us, just like galaxies are an indicator of spring to us. So I think this is what we got for you this week. Uh, as always, everyone, thanks for watching, and we hope you have a great week ahead.